Have you ever wondered what food would taste like if there weren't any form of sweeteners in them? Imagine making pancakes without sugar or not having the option of eating them with syrup. I don't think we'd like pancakes as much as we do if that were the case. Sweeteners are an essential part of our meals, and sugar is the most popular example. We know that sugar is generally made from sugarcane, but have you ever stopped to wonder what the process entails? Sugar falls into a category of foods called sweeteners. Other foods that fall into this category include honey and saccharin, and some of them have been used for thousands of years. Sugar is the most used and easiest to acquire of all sweeteners. However, honey is the first sweetener ever known to man. It was the only one used by man until around 320 BC, when Alexander the Great took a trip to India. During his trip, the emperor learned about the strange plant which produced the sweetest juice he had ever tasted, sugarcane. Unknown to Alexander, this plant had existed for thousands of years before he visited the country. Alexander's visit opened up India, where this discovery was made to the rest of the world, particularly Europe. In subsequent years, the technology to produce sugar from this plant was developed, and sugar became the most used sweetener in the world. Today, sugar is available not just in India, but all over the world, and the key to its production is sweet plants such as sugarcane and sugar beets. We go behind the scenes to see how sugar is made from sugarcane. Sugar is a generic name used to classify sweet, water-soluble carbohydrates. These include glucose, fructose, galactose, sucrose, etc. You may have heard of them in science class, but the one we're talking about in this video is sucrose, which is also known as table sugar. Like most sugars that exist out there, table sugar occurs naturally in the tissues of most plants. However, it is present in some more than others. Sugar is mainly found in fruits, but the plant with the highest sugar concentration is sugarcane, making it perfect for commercial sugar production. Converting a long stalk into the sweet crystalline substance we put in our meal includes a very long process. To summarize it, it involves two stages. The first stage involves extracting the sweet sap from the sugarcane stalks, while the second stage involves converting this sap into the refined sugar we're familiar with. So, how is sugar extracted from sugarcane? Let's find out. The process of sugar production includes four major steps. These are planting, crushing, separating, and drying. The first step, planting, takes about 14 to 18 months because this is how long it takes for a sugarcane plant to be fully mature. After maturity, the crops are harvested. First, the leaves are removed from the stalks, which are cut down either by the farmer or through the use of a machine. After harvesting, the next step is crushing and juice extraction. Once the stalks have been cut down, the canes are then cleaned thoroughly to rid them of any germs. Washing can happen in belts where they are sprayed with water, or the canes are placed in a tunnel filled with water where the current makes sure they're clean. In some industries, rotating drums are used during this process. While the drums are rotating, the canes rub against themselves, and most of the dirt is removed in the process. After the canes are cleaned, they're cut into smaller pieces and placed under a machine where they are crushed. The machine used to crush sugarcane is simply called a sugarcane crushing mill. These machines have swing hammer shredders or heavily grooved crusher rollers, which get the job done. Before the stalks are crushed completely, they are put through a series of five mills which heavily compress the stalks and squeeze out the juice until there's no more juice left in them. After all the sweet juice has been extracted, what's left is fibrous shafts called bagasse. In many industries, the byproduct is not discarded because it can serve as a fuel source. However, this isn't practiced in every sugar refinery due to limited resources. After separating the big gas from the juice, the next step is to purify the juice. The extremely sweet juice is obviously made up of mainly sugar. However, it looks nothing like what you might think. Before it is purified, it's an acidic, turbid liquid that is dark green in color. The juice is collected using tall tubs, from which they are transferred to tall vessels about 20 meters high. The cane juice is purified in these tall vessels, and its color lightens up a bit after the process is completed. This process of purification involves a chemical procedure called sulfitation. This process occurs in these tower-like vessels, which have openings at their top and bottom ends. The cane juice is introduced into the vessel from the top, while sulfur dioxide gas is introduced through the bottom opening. 
As the gas enters, it passes through the cane juice, and of course, this process occurs using a constant ratio of both substances. After sulfitation, another chemical process called carbonation is carried out. The point of carbonation is to separate the insoluble non-sugar contents of the juice from the sugar, which is the valuable portion of the juice. During this process, either calcium carbonate or calcium sulfite is used to precipitate the insoluble content of the juice, making it easy to separate from the rest of the juice. The remaining juice is heated to denature the proteins that may be present, and a lime water is added, which causes a sludge of unwanted materials to settle at the base of the tower. This process takes several hours, and at the end, the sediment is removed from the bottom of the container while the remainder of the juice is taken from the top. However, the sludge is not discarded yet. Secondary filtration is used to extract any residual sugar that might be inside. After the extraction, the remaining substance is referred to as mud, which can be used as fertilizer. The next step is to put the relatively pure cane juice into vessels called vacuum evaporators. Sugar refineries usually have a series of vacuum evaporators in which the cane juice is boiled at different pressures. Each evaporator is set at a higher pressure than the last one in the series. Therefore, the juice boils at an increasingly lower temperature as the process advances. Three things happen during this process. First, residual sediments settle at the top of the evaporators, where they're skimmed off using paddle skimmers. Second, the color of the juice fades until it becomes clear and almost colorless. Finally, the juice becomes a viscous syrup rather than the watery substance obtained from the canes initially. The next step in this procedure is called crystallization. The nearly colorless syrup is evaporated in a vacuum pan until most of what is left is sugar crystals. To aid this process, a cloudy solution of pure sucrose soaked in alcohol and glycerin is added to the syrup. The sucrose present in the solution helps to extract sugar molecules present in the syrup and convert them into crystals. As this process continues, water evaporates from the solution, making it become saturated with sugar crystals. At this point, all that's left in the vacuum pan is syrup and a lot of sugar crystals. And this mixture is known as massaquite. To separate the sugar crystals from the massaquite, the mixture is placed in a centrifuge, which rotates at 1,000 to 2,800 revolutions per minute. At the end of this procedure, only moist sugar crystals remain in the centrifuges, and these are carried on to the final stage, which is drying. The sugar crystals are dried in a large hot air dryer until they reach a water content of less than 0.02%. These dried crystals are then sorted into different sizes and packaged accordingly. When we see sugar cubes at breakfast, we don't really think about the work that goes into making this indispensable product. These long steps aim to ensure that top quality sugar is made available to consumers worldwide.